Extras. In the wake of the treachery of Baron Woodbridge and the horrific death march that led his people to their doom, his entire province was left vacant of people and of valuables. But the land remained. Farms, buildings, massive wealth of the sort that can't simply be moved. As the party returned from Good Place, they stopped in at the Silver Load estate. It was practically on the way. And there, Draven made the case to his father-in-law that the power vacuum, and frankly the peasant vacuum, could lead to all kinds of inappropriate land grabs by nearby lords, not to mention endless squatters followed quickly by bandits and other crime to prey on them. Draven's suggestion was to send in as many forces as Baron Silverlode could spare from his own guard regiments to patrol Woodbridge and attempt to prevent all those problems before anyone else even becomes aware of the disaster. This might earn some goodwill from the king and from anyone else around who would be concerned by the breakdown of law and order. Draven was already looking forward to other possibilities. With tens of thousands of people simply gone, that land would need to be repopulated. Whether or not there was any chance of Draven ending up as the new Baron of Woodbridge, Vistria had too many people packed into his large cities, and so, so many landless Verandi refugees, Draven's fellow countrymen, who were far less fortunate than he was. And as tragic as the situation was, these events created a great opportunity to match landless people with peopleless lands. Baron Magnusson, Ivana's father, agreed, sending in a number of troops, at least for the short term, to prevent or reduce anarchy right next door to his own lands. The unforeseen negative consequence of this was that about a week later, when the party swept in on horseback warning of orcs, there were about one-third fewer silver-load soldiers around to patrol or scout for the orcish intruders, let alone to fight them. Not that Draven or the other PCs wanted any soldiers making contact with these deadly enemies, but it was certainly uncomfortable, especially for the soldiers themselves or anyone else living in those towns or in the Baron's castle, who didn't have the metagame perspective to know that this small band of heroes were much better than ten times their number in baronial guards. The fourth level cleric spell, Divination, can be extremely powerful and well worthy of being the eponymous example of an entire school of magic. It also simply cannot answer some of the questions which I let the players ask in episode 21. Just can't. The actual scope of what it can tell you in 3.5 edition is a question concerning a specific goal, event, or activity that is to occur within one week. So the actual central question, where they should go in order to catch those orcs, is exactly the kind of thing divination is intended for. The spell leaves the GM plenty of room to weasel out, if it would skip too much plot or key encounters, but it can help the party get back on track if they lose the thread or miss critical clues. In this case, it would have been a real pain to intercept the small, stealthy group without some kind of divinations. However, even though the spell description is very open to interpretation, you can argue whether it would be able to answer about Baron Deathmore's location. If he was within a week's travel, maybe that would cause them to go after him, but they were clearly doing something else right now which most likely conflicted with that course of action. But I gave them an answer which didn't really help, so that evens out. Now, who sent these orcs? That relates to the party's current goals and activities. I didn't choose to block it, but there is a roll every time, and it happened to fail. There's no way the spell can reasonably answer, who sent some guys I never met almost a year ago, given they seem to have nothing to do with the current quest, or any action that might take place within a week. They could have asked, were these orcs sent by the same person who sent Marp's group? That may be a legitimate question, but a strong argument can be made that it's too close to who sent the current group, and since you can't ask a failed question again until you gain a level, that version of the question should automatically fail. In the end, though, when Zaheer asked about Marp's crew, I decided to have his deity answer it anyway because it gave them a very interesting and intriguing piece of information that they would otherwise probably never find out. Story, the rule of cool, 
And of course, you're asking the gods. They really decide what information you can and can't get. After getting the clue from the injured soldier and drawing the correct conclusion from that little snippet of orcish chatter, the heroes raced back and reached the Silverload Castle before the orcs. They didn't know how long they had to prepare, but the party found themselves with a lot of different ways they could approach the problem of defending the Frost Giant Sword and, more importantly, Draven's in-laws and their people. The Baron trusts Draven enough to follow most advice he would give in a scenario like this. So although Baron Magnuson and the Baroness refused to leave their fortified and guarded home, despite how dangerous orcs are, they have some pride, and they don't want to be seen as, or even see themselves as, running away from three brutes. So they refused to leave their castle, but otherwise the PCs had a fair amount of leeway to plan the disposition of the baronial guard forces. I wish I had better notes about discussions like this to tell you who suggested what when, which suggestions were just brainstorming and which ones were really advocated by various players, but a number of strategies were discussed. Evacuating the surrounding town was a pretty clear choice, but there was some question of whether they should evacuate the villagers into the castle, where they had fortifications, or to send them away to the next nearest town, which required them to detach some of the troops to oversee them. And though they did choose this route, the evacuation takes a little longer because it's not as easy convincing the peasants to leave their homes so far behind. Withdrawing into the castle is a more natural and expected precaution. The main question was whether and how to defend the castle against a tiny force of elite warriors. Shredding them with massed ranged attacks from atop the walls would be great, but it was hard to imagine the orcs standing around and allowing that. If the gates were shut, it wasn't clear how the enemy could approach the fortress, get over or through the walls, and proceed to the inner keep and the dining hall to reach the sword, but somehow they figured the orcs would find a way. So where should they position themselves? Defend the keep from the walls? There's a lot of wall, even if the six of them spread out, and we know how smart splitting up is. They could just camp out in a room with the sword, and the orcs would certainly come to them, but how many soldiers would they kill on the way in? And though it didn't seem very orky, they couldn't rule out some small chance the orcs might adopt some more devious strategy, like taking hostages, or running around killing everyone they could. On the other hand, standing in front of the gate seemed likely to work, to run into the orcs before any guards were killed, and fighting them within crossbow range of the battlements would be a big advantage. But it could easily go wrong if the orcs tried to sneak in elsewhere, avoiding them completely, and these particular orcs were already sneaking through the countryside. Angel also wanted to lay literal traps for the orcs. She has some skill in making traps, and yet they rarely seem to come up. Unfortunately, the same problems of placement were even worse for traps, as without knowing the angle of approach or where they would come in contact with the orcs, it was nigh impossible to set something up in advance with any significant chance of working. So despite the great risks to the brave men and women, sending out scouts seemed to have been the best strategy, and as we saw in the episode, it worked out quite well. In fact... The heroes obliterated the orcs in a rather embarrassing miscalculation of difficulty on my part. I actually had two different versions of these guys statted up and ready to go, since there was a chance that at least one player couldn't make it that night. But everyone did make it, so this was actually supposed to be the hard version of the trio. So why were these guys, who I had put some characterization into, such pushovers? I discussed some of it in the video, like, obviously... Unless the player characters are poorly optimized, it's hard to build monsters, especially ones using humanoid, class-based design, that can still be dangerous when outnumbered two to one by the heroes. Zaheer and his henchman, Mahar, aren't really worth two heroes, like the monk is not optimized enough for that, and frankly the original PCs are death machines by now, with all their gear. But in this context, the pair still get two sets of actions every round, and that's what it's all about here the action economy. Every round the three orcs get three actions, where the heroes get six. That's a big gap to overcome. There was another major problem though. I wanted to have a standoff, some awesome pre-battle chat, 
or at least set things up so that there was a good chance that would happen. But for whatever reason, I picked sort of a random distance. I think it was 80 feet. That was stupid. It effectively guaranteed the orcs could do little of use in the first round. Just starting at 50 or 60 feet apart might have risked aggroing the PCs, but in hindsight, I shouldn't have been so paranoid. And at that range, the orcs could have charged, made contact, and gotten to use all their various tricks. In my animation, Zill and Little One's searing charges met in midair, which was awesome. They both had searing charge. But Zill started out of range, so really, in game terms, Little One charged him, and Zill was stuck. Hell, he had sidestep charge, but Little One hit him anyway, even through the feet. In fact, the encounter was so one-sided, I had to make a hard choice. The orcs had a fair amount of gear, and as fun as it is to get the fat loot, uh, fat in the sense of P-H-A-T, which is almost the opposite of the orcish word fat, as, as fun as it is, if they get too much loot without working for it, it just makes it harder to reward them properly when they really do earn it. A problem already running rife in our campaign due to Draven's aggressive item crafting. So, I removed a couple of custom activated items which I had given the orcs, but which they weren't going to live long enough to use properly anyway. I was running into a bigger problem here. The orc mystique requires them to be badass. That's why you would probably never encounter an orc below 5th level unless you were looking for the young or untrained deep in the desert or in the orc-controlled province of Gruul. They're never minions. But this isn't an MMO setting. It doesn't make sense if they keep scaling up infinitely to stay ahead of the PCs. There are only so many orcs to begin with, and there can't be that many level 12, 14, or 16 ones running around, or they'd cause a hell of a lot of damage in the world around them. Champions like that have to be rare for the world to make much sense. In fact, I don't like to have too many of them above level 8 or 9, which is why these guys, however optimized, couldn't do what they needed to against the oversized party. But I also don't like orcs running around in big groups, unless there's a really good reason. Clearly, I was going to have to do some serious thinking about how to make orcs work within these self-imposed constraints. Funny thing is, even before this encounter, when they were in New Vanover, Little One and Angel had wanted to learn to speak orcish for various reasons, even though modern orcs don't actually speak orcish, other than a few slang words here and there. But to this end, Angel had done some looking around, using her organization contact in the city, and had found an elf, the only race who had preserved the ancient orc tongue, as King Dietrich had decreed all his people would learn their language in the aftermath of the Shadow War, where orcs destroyed so much. But Angel found this elf and managed to convince him to teach the two of them a little orcish whenever they were in town. Out of curiosity more than anything else, certainly she didn't bring up how Little One hoped to use it to rally orcs to his banner in the future. But in talking to him, trying to convince him to take them on and teach them, Angel learned that their tutor was one of the only elves known to be in Vistria. The fair folk were always pretty rare in these parts, but of the few who were in the human nation, most had left for home over the last year or so, and even this man was planning to leave, having delayed his departure several times already. So Angel started trying to probe further into this rather mysterious fact. Why are the elves leaving? Getting answers out of any elfery ladron, when it was a subject they preferred to avoid, was extremely difficult. But Angel worked every conversational angle she could, and kept prompting him, using her conclusions or extrapolations based on his comments, to ferret out more information. Though he said almost nothing explicitly, what she eventually worked out of him was that in the Feywild, the Eladrin had become embroiled in a serious conflict with the Formians. Somehow the Ant-Men and their fortifications had appeared on the doorstep of Verdual in, in a very short time, and were expanding their territory throughout that whole part of the Feywild. The Eladrin had called in the aid of the Elves, who had decided to keep this problem internal, 
and do not allow it to become another distraction for the humans and dwarves who were already deep in their own conflicts with the Diluvians. Although Angel wasn't particularly attached to the part of the Feywild that was under attack, she was still a native of that plane, and it was striking to her because she'd passed through the Eladrin lands when she first journeyed to the Feylands. It was hard to imagine such vast areas being lacerated with Formian trenches. Don't forget to like these videos, and if you want to listen to more of me, you can always follow me on Twitter at TalesDDC, on Facebook, I'm Demonac AGC, and I'm starting a new Tumblr where I'll post the occasional image and some other thoughts, mostly about the design, production, and other aspects of my YouTube channel and TDDC. That's at demonac.tumblr.com.